Okay, yeah, so we're done with, uh, with discrete priors, uh, which we sort of saw before in, uh, in the introduction lecture as well. But now the real interesting game here is how to use continuous priors. And uh, like I said, we're going to use something called beta. Why do we want to use it? What special feature about it? And how we can use it? That's the core uh, for the second half of this lecture. Okay. So remember, for the discrete prior, this is what we had. And of course, uh, we computed everything. I read, I read post this play table over here for you. I want you. I want to ask you about your opinion. Do you see anything? sort of unsatisfactory in this way of uh, specifying prior. And we can do the calculation, Facebook can do, that's fine. But do you see any kind of limitation in terms of using this discrete prior for P? Yes, Bob? The paddle properties less than 0.3 or greater than 0.8. They Those, never appear, yes. right? So. As you can see here, for prior distribution, say for this P, if the values of P were never specified in the prior, you will never show up in the posterior, right? So you just give it them zero. It's fine if you want to give it, but that's definitely like a limitation of what you can do, right? And I want to point out that not only at the two ends, but anything in between, right? I have no 0 .5, 0 0.55, I have no 0.64, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So anything that you do not specify in the prior won't show up in the posterior, and that's simply because of base rule, right? Because you need to have the values of p to get the likelihood. And even though I should say this, so this is this is the list of values, right? And we specify a prior distribution that assigns some probability for each of the six, right? So first of all, what Ross says is, because P does not include anything below 0.3 and above 0.3, and I added nothing in between either. So that means in the prior distribution, those, probab those numbers uh, are assigned with probability zero. Okay? And because of that, it would never show up in the posterior, because all is zero, right? Yeah. But also, I want to say that this is the case that we did assign non-zero probability for all of the values, right? But if, um, if for some reason I decided to give zero to 0.3, and then I just bump up, bump up uh, 0.4 to uh, 0.25, then that will go to zero too, right? So that again, I mean, I mean the posterior probability of P equals to 0.3 will be zero again because this time it's the prior that is zero, okay? So there are many, many tricky or like I would say limitation in terms of using discrete um, prior distribution, even though it makes sense, even though it helps us to actually do the, base, uh, the posterior calculation uh, more straightforwardly, but um, it definitely has limitations. So that's the call, I think, why we want to try to come up with the continuous prior. Continuous prior meaning that any possible values of P can be considered. Okay. But of course, as we talked in about earlier, it's not in the prior distribution, it's not only about the values of P, but also about the probability that you assign to P, right? So when I'm talking about posterior, uh, no, when I'm talking about continuous prior, well, I'm saying that first of all, I want to have a continuous, uh, so I should say, I want to have a continuous prior that can cover any values of P. So that makes what? The range from zero to one, right? Because P is the percentage. We should go from zero to one, okay? But of course, the particular continuous distribution that we're gonna try to come up with should have a particular way to assign probability to different values of P, okay? And it should be a proper distribution, meaning that you should integrate to one, okay? And for example, if I think 0.5 is definitely much more likely than 0.8, then I would like to have a prior, continuous prior distribution that would favor 0.5 okay, over 0.8. So how to do that will be what we're gonna discuss in this um, continuous prior section. So I've been talking about this limitation, and um, the first one people can think of is the uniform. 
right? Uniform. Uniform distribution has the discrete version and the continuous version, okay? Discrete version, uh, we don't have to cover. The continuous version is um, from zero to one, right? Any value of P is equally likely, and the PMF is one over B minus A. B is the upper bound, A is the lower bound. For our case, it's gonna be a uniform between zero and one. Okay? So the PDF will be one between uh, zero and one, and zero elsewhere. Okay? So of course, this is a continuous. It covers any possible values of P. But it's also pretty strong in the sense that I think P is equally likely, right? This can be a possible prior distribution for you if you think, oh, I have no idea. I have no idea what P should be. Let me just give it uniform and let the data decide. Okay? So this usually is called a, like a weekly prior. Okay? Weekly informative, I should say. Weekly informative prior. That I have no idea. I cannot guess better. So I'm going to let the data decide and use a uniform. Okay. But of course, sometimes you might have stronger prior or stronger prior opinion that you think certain values should be higher than the other ones. So that's the case where we can use um, the so-called um, beta distribution. Okay. So let's do this step by step. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the beta distribution, like the PMF, the PDF, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, go to the uh, Bayesian inference using this prior. Okay. So um, Beta distribution has two parameters, A and B, okay, the only two parameters. And it's a random variable falling between zero and one. Okay? So that's why it makes it pretty ideal for making inference about proportion, okay? Because it covers the range that a proportion can take. Okay? So beta distribution has two, we call them shape parameters, A and B. And then the PDF is written uh, in equation 12 here. So the capital B, A, B is a beta function. So it's a little bit tedious, but it's important to know. So B, A, B is gamma. So gamma is gamma function. You don't have to worry about it like R can compute it for you. But it's, uh, I want to give the detail, the constant here going on. So B, A, B is gamma A times gamma B divided by gamma A plus B. So um, that's the constant goes in here. But then the kernel, which is the part that is related to the unknown parameters over here. Okay. So it's P raised to A minus one, and one minus P raised to B minus one. Okay. So just looking at the PDF, do you see anything familiar? It looks like a binomial geometry. Mm -hmm. like it's, yes. It's, it's so, Right, so if binomial, so remember, binomial distribution, if we use that as the data model, if we express it in terms of the likelihood function, which means it's a function of the unknown P, this part looks very similar, isn't it? Right, so with the binomial likelihood function, we have what? We have P raised to Y and Y minus P raised to a and minus y, right? Yeah, and the interpretation over there is it should be the probability of success raised to a number of sex times, uh, one minus a p, which is the failure probability minus the number of failures. Okay? So this looks very similar, right? So keep this in mind. As soon as when we try to derive what the posterior distribution it should be, you will see how useful this can be can be for you, okay. all right. And by the way, I should say the continuous uniform that I said earlier is a special case with A equals to B equals to one. Okay. So you can also express uniform zero one to be beta one one, okay. Okay, so this is just nine different curves, uh, beta curves that play with different values of A and B. And um, what, yeah, so I'm plotting in here. Uh, so the middle one is beta 1, 1. Okay, so remember that's the uniform. Okay, so uniform, not surprisingly, the PDF is at 1, and it's a horizontal line, right? 
So that's pretty strong. Oh no, I shouldn't say pretty strong. Pretty specific. It's just anything is equally likely. Okay. So among the other eight, do you have specific, say, like comments or like any, yeah, any comments about, say, if I pick the first one, what kind of prior information I'm, I'm introducing if I'm using that as a prior for P? So U shape, by horseshoe. Yes. Tell me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that like the extremes are more likely to occur. Right. That's what the first one is telling us, right? The middle one, less likely, the least likely, I should say. And uh, yeah. and uh, the the end ones are more likely, and they're symmetric, right? And that's a pretty special way of thinking about the prior information as well. What about what about the last one? Oh, by the way, this is beta 0.5.5. Sorry about the little size here. What about this one, beta 4.2? What do you think this shape is conveying about <coughs> this um, prior belief of you if you want to use it as a prior? We might have assigned slightly higher values to priors from 0.6 to 0.8 when we mm -hmm. first started. Yeah, so from 0.6 to 0.8, especially I think the peak is roughly, yeah, very close to 0.8, right? And the shape tells us that this is the most likely value. It's not really symmetric. It has a sort of like a longer left tail, meaning that um, I think, say, point, like really small values were pretty less, oh, pretty, pretty not, oh, Pretty unlikely. Okay. And of course, you can come up with different other priors um, of theta to use, but as you might have guessed, wow, if I have to plot all kinds of betas to decide what I'm going to use, it's going to be tedious, right? So um, a way that you can do it is, um, so this is talking about how to choose a beta curve to represent your prior opinion. Okay? So since it's difficult to guess, and we can use one way to do it called, you can do specifying by specification of quantiles of the distribution. So quantile, again, about the rank order of values. Okay. So for example, the middle quantile or the 50th quantile is the medium. Okay. So the beta underscore quantile function in R, actually it inputs a probability measure P, and outputs of the value of x such that you're going to have the quantile to be p. Okay, so let's take this a little bit slowly here. So for a beta distribution, say beta 710, I want to find the quantile of 0.5. Then I will use the beta quantile function to get the value that is at the fifth. 50th quantile. So that's what it is. So if you try to use this beta quantile, so first of all, you have this um, 7 and 10 because these are the um, parameters, the shape parameters for the beta distribution. Okay, And then you put in the quantile. So as you can see in the plot down here, it is the beta 710 function. And I'm trying to find the value that up until that point, the area under the curve is 50%. Okay? And I can find that by using this function, which gives me 0.608. Yes? Uh, is the beta function defined so that it is always a valid uh, random variable? Yeah, so let me go back to oops, let me go back to the previous slide. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. So the beta, as you said, the beta distribution is well defined and it integrates to one. Okay. And the ranges uh, the ranges from zero to one.
All right, so I'm bringing this idea here uh, is because in order to choose the two parameters uh, of the beta distribution to represent your prior, you can first think about the quantiles of P that you think is reasonable, and then use that to come up with the prior. Okay, so let me be more specific. So this beta.select function is in the teach base package. And the way to do this is you will first think about specifying two quantiles. Say if I think the medium should be 0.5, for example. And I think, say, the 90th percentile the 90th percentile should be 0.8, for example. If I can come up with two of this, then the beta select function will be able to find the beta curve that matches with these two quantiles I can think of. Okay. So suppose you believe that the 50th quantile is at 0.55, okay. and you also guess that the 90th quantile is at 0.8, then you can use this beta select function here. As you can see, you have to input two lists. One is for the first quantile uh, value that you think of. So it's 0.55 and 0.5 for X and P. And then the second one is 0.8 and 0.9. Okay. And the beta select function is going to give you the value of A and value of P. And that will be the prior that you can use. All right, so this exercise I put it here, assuming people have a uh, laptop, so it's okay. We don't have to do this um, here, and uh, I guess exercise two as well, but it will be something interesting for you to go back to do it. Because in class, I can only just demonstrate with one particular example, but that might not be what you think should be the prior distribution. Um, so you might want to play around with it, and that also gets your familiarity with R and then all of the functions that we are that we need to use, okay? But in short, the beta select function can help you to choose a beta curve to represent your prior, and the two information that you need to put in is a set of um, the quantile, and then the set of the numbers that you think at those quantile. Okay? And then with this two, you'll be able to get um, a particular beta distribution to represent your prior. Okay? For this case, we're using Beta 3.6 and beta 2.56. Right, good. So I can stop here.